Let's open our time together with prayer. Holy and loving God, we've gathered once again in this spiritual place to worship you. We've tried to turn the distractions, the alerts, the notifications, the to-do list, and the other ideas from the rest of our lives off in an attempt to turn our hearts and minds and selves to you. And so as we gather in this place, spiritually speaking, of course, we gather seeking spiritual strength and nourishment from you. May we, through the songs that are sung and played, through the scriptures that are read and heard, through the words that are offered, through prayer and through sermon, may they all be uplifting to you and may they turn our hearts towards you and shape us to be more like you. There are many other prayers we can ask, and we give thanks today that we can ask them in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I wish you good morning and welcome to worship with Oxford Baptist Church. It is good to be able to be with you on this, the first Sunday of February, as we share together in a video-based worship service. After our deacon blessing last week and our missions celebration the week before, we're kind of back to normal, but I want to thank Danny and Kristen and, and others for the part they have played in, in, in putting this worship service together with us. It is... Uh, the nice thing about being able to do video-based worships is we can use folks where they're at, uh, where they feel comfortable, where they feel most safe in order to put this service together as kind of a collage and a collective for all of us to appreciate and enjoy and hopefully uh, be strengthened in our faith because we've spent this time together. I wish you uh, well this morning as you're sharing in this service with us. I pray that the Lord will speak to you through the songs, through the prayers, through the scriptures, and through the sermon uh, as we spend this time together. And I trust that you will be strengthened for the journey for today and the days that lie ahead because you have spent this time uh, with us, spread out afar, but with us in spirit. Welcome to worship. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning and you this morning. So, do you know what we celebrate on February the 14th? Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Do you do some fun things to get ready for Valentine's Day? Because Valentine's Day is next Sunday. So, what do we do for Valentine's Day? What's something that you do for Valentine's Day? Give my, my family some Valentine's Day. 
You give your family some Valentines. What have you done? I made some Valentines to my friends. To your friends. Have you made Valentines for your school friends and your friends? Yeah, we do all kinds of things like that. You might buy something for them and share and write their name on it and give them to them at school. You might make something for them. You might buy treats for them. You might make them a card or a letter for Valentine's Day. So we do all kinds of fun things like this. Why do we do that? Why do we do that on Valentine's Day? Because we share how we love them and care for them. We're doing that to show them how much we love them and care for them. Have you ever seen these candy hearts? These people might call them conversation hearts because what do they have on them? Notes. They have little notes. notes, don't they? Or words on there for conversation hearts or conversation with somebody. Some of them say you're awesome. Some of them say you're so cool. Some of them say love. And so you might see these at Valentine's Day and they're sending somebody a message. Do you know who sends us messages in this God book? God and, and Jesus. Yes. So God sends us messages kind of like Valentine's. When we send messages or Valentine's to our friends, that's a special Valentine. That's a special treat for them. And God sends us messages through the Bible and his scripture and his word, just like we might give Valentine's to our friends. So inside your Bible, there's a heart on there, and it says something that has a verse of scripture. So can you pull one out, and we'll talk about it. Do you know what it says? Look on the other side. It says, you are loved. You are loved. So... And this one in John 3, 16, I bet some of you know that familiar Bible verse. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's John 3, 16. And most people know that Bible verse. Do you know what that means? Who loves you? God. God, he sent his only son, he sent Jesus to show that he loves you. So that's a special Valentine, and that's a special message he's sending us in that verse of Scripture. Can you pull out one there? Ooh, this one says, you are wonderful. In Psalm 139, voice, verse 14, it says, I praise you because I am, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. Do you know who thinks you're wonderful? God and Jesus. They do. And lots of other people think you're wonderful, too. He made you to be exactly who you are. You have a special talent in this world that he wants you to go out and he wants to do for other people. And he loves you and he wants you to show how wonderful you are to other people and use that because he thinks you are wonderful. Can you pull out another one? What's it say on the other side? I am. I I am always with you. So it says, I am always with you. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, it says, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Do you know what that means? Who's always with you? God. God's always with you. If you're ever scared, who can you talk to? God. God, he's going to make you feel better and give you peace at times. That's a special Valentine. That's a special verse of scripture that he's given us in the Bible. Can you pick this one? Ooh, this one says, you are forgiven. In Psalm 103, verse 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Do you know what transgressions are? Mm -mm. That means sins or wrongs. Sometimes do we do things that God might not be happy with? We all do things sometimes that he might not be happy with. But you know what? He's going to forgive you. This scripture says you are forgiven. And sometimes you might not have a good day, but guess what? You can always talk to God. Will he make it better? Yes. Can you pull out the last one? The last one says what? He heals. He heals. So today's scripture comes from Psalm 147. It's in verse 1 through 11. And it says, The Lord heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. So just what we were just talking about. If you ever have a bad day, or if you're ever feeling bad about something, who can you talk to? God. You can always talk to God and he'll make you feel better, doesn't he? Are these some special Valentines? Yes, you make special Valentines for your friends. And God, he's kind of like our Valentine. And he's sending you special messages through the Bible. That's pretty special, isn't it? Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for sending us messages and talking to us through the Bible and being our Valentine. Thank you for showing us how to love filling us with love, and please help us spread that love to others on Valentine's Day and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning is taken from Psalm 147, 
verses 1 through 11. Praise for Jerusalem's restoration and prosperity. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is becoming. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. The Lord supports the afflicted. He brings down the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises to our God on the life, who covers the heavens with clouds, who provides rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow on the mountains. He gives to the beast its food and to the young ravens which cry. He does not delight in the strength of the horses. He does not take pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord favors those who fear him, those who wait for his loving kindness. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. We come now to a moment of prayer. Will you join me as we pray together? Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for the day that we have. We give you thanks for all the days that we have had and trust that you will be with us as we look towards the days to come. But as we pause for prayer, we settle into some moments, realizing our great need for your presence, for your love, and for your strength. Lord, certainly this last year has been difficult. For all the reasons we can go on to name, you know the things that we feel stressed by, feel overwhelmed by, feel constrained by. You know the weights that have been placed upon us. You know the losses that we are feeling. You know the grief that we are experiencing. You know the isolation that we are feeling. You know the anxiety that has filled us. And yet, Lord, we know a few things also. We know that it's been difficult for you. We know that many have it worse than us. We know that it's not a competition, but we know it could be worse. And therefore we ask, help us to know that you are with us. Help us to trust that you have the whole world in your hands. Help us to draw assurance as we think about grief and the grief we are experiencing. Help us to feel the assurance that you are holding our loved ones with you. And help us, as we long for a light at the end of the tunnel, to keep walking forward in faith, trusting that in faith you will guide us, that you walk alongside us, that you carry us when we cannot carry ourselves, and that you know every desire of our heart and every need of our hands. And so you are working to provide for us, even amid what we feel our great difficulties. So, Lord, we confess our needs and our prayers to you. We thank you for hearing them. And we ask you to help us to sit and trust that you will be with us as we move forward into your call upon us for the living of these days. Hear our prayers. Help us to feel your presence. And it's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, that we pray. Amen.
as we turn to the scriptures this morning and turn to our sermon, we turn to a reading from the gospel. We read today from the gospel of Mark chapter 1. We'll share in verses 29 through 39. Hear now this reading of God's word. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him, that is Jesus, about her at once. Jesus came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve him. That evening, at sunset, they brought, him, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And they cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning then, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place and he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him, and when they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim my, the message there also. For that's what I came to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in the synagogues and casting out demons. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. i got to tell you, the reading of this scripture takes me back to the 90s. First, just anecdotally and personally, it takes me back to the late 90s when I was in college, a student at Baylor University, and in our introduction to ministry class, this was the scripture text that I had to write what probably was my first sermon about. But more to the point of today's sermon, I go back to June of 1994. It was June of 1994, the beginning of the summer, and our youth group had gone to youth camp at Falls Creek, Oklahoma. Our pastor at the time, Dr. Leroy Patterson, joined us for a couple days of youth camp, sort of a get to know you time. And at the time, Dr. Patterson was 59 years old, but he might, have, might as well have been 99, because Dr. Patterson, he was old school. He was good old, old school, good old Southern Baptist. I could tell you more about Dr. Patterson, things I liked, things I didn't like. The reality is a couple of the things he did very much shaped my ministry in very uh, interesting ways that I reflect on all the time. But one night during the youth group share time, there was, you know, 50 of us. It was a big youth group. It was a big church. We were gathered, reflecting on the day, and the conversation transitioned to asking questions of the pastor who was there, because he didn't normally come to youth camp. But he came for a few days that week just to get in touch with what was going on with us. And I had noticed that he did this thing each time he baptized somebody. And since it was kind of this open question and answer session, I said, Dr. Patterson, I, I got a question. How come when you hold your hand up over someone being baptized and you say, I baptize you, my brother or my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How come you touch your ring like that? Is that like some identification with the nails in Jesus' hand? Some theological thing that you are doing? And his answer is down to us. He said, what do I do? 
You see, all of us have noticed that every single time he did a baptism, he held his hand up and he held his ring just like this. He did this. But he had no idea that that was his habit. He had, he had not realized that he did that every single time. So, there was no conscious theological statement in his hand movement. Rather, it was an unconscious, subconscious habit that he had, I guess, gotten himself into. You can imagine how it went the next time, which wasn't long after this youth camp. He was up to baptize folks in the baptistry. He stood in the baptistry. He held his hand up and said, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And he pulled his finger back. We would watch for many times afterward, and, and Dr. Patterson then was forced to wrestle with this little habit he had that somehow he didn't know he had, and we had unsuspectingly called attention to. Ultimately, the youth made a game of it, and we would kind of giggle on our row, or rows, about what it was that was happening, and whether he would touch his ring that week or not. I share that story because it, it underscores one simple thing. An old habit is hard to break. The patterns we set, the rhythms we create, the things we do repeatedly have a way of shaping us as much as we seek to shape them. Dr. Patterson eventually never shook the pattern of touching his ring during a baptism. Years later, I would visit, uh, coming home from college and attend worship and see him do a baptism, and I think he just went on and forgot and just started touching his ring again. There are times, though, when we need to be shaken from our patterns and our rhythms. We need to be jolted away from what we knew. And the thing about this is, sometimes when a dramatic change comes, we need to move on and walk in a new way. We need to walk in the new, newness of life because we've been healed. Today's scripture reading is about a healing, and it's set in the midst of a bunch of healings. In the synagogue, Jesus had been healing, and then they come to this, this instance at Simon's house, and he heals Simon's mother-in-law. And then he goes on to the other towns and cities to heal and to rebuke demons there. And there's a couple of things worth noting that I'm just going to note and move on from as we think about this passage. I don't want us to get hung up on them, but the reality is the demons knew who Jesus was and they responded. When they didn't speak, they got out of the way. The, de the demons knew that Jesus was more powerful than them. The power of God has the power to overcome. And so we need to be wise about that. The second thing that's peculiar is that phrasing, as it relates to him healing Simon's mother-in-law, lifting her up, and then she goes back to serve. In our scriptural imagination study, we thought about how we read this scripture. On Wednesday afternoon, we talked about how we read this scripture. And there are some who may want to misread this scripture in some way or another. But the reality is, Jesus healing her and her going back to serving did not put her in her place. If you're tempted to read the scripture now. Jesus healing her allowed her to take the position of privilege, which was that of being the host. In the culture at the time, she felt the shame that she was letting her guests down. And so her being raised up and healed brought dignity and hope and respect and love 
to her situation. Furthermore, she's the first person that's named specifically that was healed by Mark. And the conventions of the time would have been such that you would not have identified that a woman was healed. Yet it was clear from Mark's gospel that Jesus healed the woman. He didn't heal the man. It's almost scandalous that Mark tells the story this way. Because typically the woman would have hardly been mentioned. But this woman is named and her status within the community is elevated and restored. Because Jesus is challenging the expectations. He's upending the norms. And he is bringing about a radical hospitality to all the people who need healing. Jesus is meeting the needs of those who needed their needs met most. Jesus is not privileging a certain class of people. He didn't go to the powerful, to the elite, or to the leaders first. He went to the ones who had the most need. And what did he do when he got there? And what does this passage do for us? When you read this passage, do you identify yourself as someone who was healed? Because I think it's okay for you to do that. Because I think that's how the passage lands for us today. You see, once Simon's mother-in-law was healed, she got up and she went on with her life. The same must have been true for the rest of the town and all of those folks who needed healing because, well, Mark doesn't tell us that they showed back up at the house the next day. Jesus doesn't wait at the house the next day. Jesus had done, done his work. He healed everybody. He sent them off to do what they could do because they had been healed, and he moved on to the next town. So that he, he could heal, heal there, and heal there, and heal there. And when Jesus healed someone, they were healed. It was time for them to be faithful and to walk into the newness of life because they had been healed. And I tell you what, for you and me today, at least spiritually speaking, we have been healed. We have been forgiven. We have been loved by God. We have had gifts given to us and a call placed on us by God because the Lord has healed us, forgiven us of our brokenness, and called us to walk in the newness of life. But I don't know if all of us are living it out. Are all of us living out our call as faithfully and as fully as possible within the constraints of our time? Or are some of us allowing our doubts or our fears or the constraints of our time to create an apathy or a laziness in us? And in doing so, is that keeping us from being all that God created us as his children to be. You see, it's okay in life to want a little affirmation and reaffirmation. It's normal that we would engage in positive reinforcement that, yes, yes, it is good, you are on your way. Yes, yes, you're on the right track. Yes, yes, that seems like what God's calling you to do. Yes, yes, you have been healed. And that positive reinforcement is important. But sometimes, I think us Christians don't get on with walking. We don't get on with moving forward. We get held back by our old habits, our old limitations, and we put, put that old baggage back on ourselves. And that keeps us from walking forward. So we go back to the door of Simon's house, Wait to be healed once again, only to find Jesus in the healing there anymore. 
We've already been healed. We're already called to walk. That's why I shared that story about Dr. Patterson at the beginning of the beginning of the sermon. He had a hard time moving on from this old habit. But spiritually speaking, the old habits we need to break are bigger than just touching your ring during a baptism or a ritual. Mark doesn't tell us about anybody who went back to the house that day. Jesus healed those folks and it was time for them to move on. After healing, he expects people to get up and walk into the fullness of life. His work was done. And so again, I don't want us to go back to the door of Simon's house. I don't want us to sit around waiting for affirmation that we've been healed. I don't want us to be like Dr. Patterson in that moment, trying to decide if we're going to touch our ring or not. Like, well, I don't need to do that anymore. It's time we realize we don't need any more healing, at least spiritually speaking. We need to, like Simon's mother-in-law, get up and walk and get on with what God's called us to do and to be. We need to quit looking at the door expecting more. We need to remember that we have been healed. The title of this sermon is You're Up. You are up. Whether you take that, that phrasing to remind you of how Jesus lifted Simon's mother-in-law up, or whether you take that phrasing to think about a baseball player who is up, you are no longer in the on-deck circle. It's time to bat. It's time to play. It's time to go about that which we're called to do. So don't take any more pitches. Don't wait by any more strange doors. Get up and move forward. Because God has healed us. God has blessed us. God has prepared for us to be a light in the darkness to bring about the kingdom of God. We're up. So what are we waiting for? It's time to walk. And the Lord who healed us will walk with us every step of the way. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, you've called us to get up and walk. You've forgiven us and you've healed us spiritually speaking. So help us to walk faithfully in the way that you're leading us. May we listen to you. May we hear your voice. May we sense your presence alongside us or even behind us, pushing us as we need to go and where we need to go. May we get up and walk into the new life you've created for us. This, O oh Lord, is our prayer. We offer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, today. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us in worship. It has been good to be able to provide this for you, and I pray that this time that you've spent uh, will nourish and strengthen you for the journey that lies ahead. For the month of February, we will be doing video-based services like this, but we'll be beginning uh, in just a week and a half, two weeks, uh, to start 
uh, with some new opportunities that we hope you'll join uh, join uh, with us in. Uh, on Wednesday, the 17th, it's Ash Wednesday, we'll have a video-based Ash Wednesday service for you, a devotional of sorts. And then starting on Wednesday night, the 24th, we are going to have Zoom meetings with our CBF field personnel who are spread across the world. Uh, so one of the things we never would have thought about before would be Zooming with a missionary in Japan or in Spain. But now, because we've been using our technology in different ways, we're able to do that. And we look forward to uh, doing that, to, to sharing and hearing from the Fushis in, 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 in Japan, from the Normans in Spain, from the Samples over in San Francisco, from the Wyatts in Raleigh, who are so close and yet so far away, and then from Nell Green, who has relocated to Rock Hill, South Carolina. That, those will be happening starting on the 24th, and I hope you will uh, join us. Send me an email or give me a call, and I'll, I'll walk you through how you can join those Zooms as they happen. And we'll try to record them so that you can watch them later if you can't make it in real time. I'd encourage you to join us on Wednesday at noon for noonday, midday prayers. Uh, that time is 30 to 40 minutes. We spend time sitting with the scriptures and, and fellowshipping with one another here in the beauty of the sanctuary. And uh, so I hope you will uh, find a way to join us. It's a good time, and I trust that uh, by making the effort to come, you will, you will appreciate the time we can spend together. And finally, about that, I know we're all conscious about what we feel comfortable doing and not doing, what feels safe and what doesn't feel safe. Uh, it is a small crowd on Wednesdays, and everybody is following uh, excellent protocols, so I think you can feel safe uh, joining us. Uh, I trust uh, that, that your, your risk is, is minimal, and I hope that if you feel a need to be in this space to nurture your soul, you'll use that opportunity to do so. There will be other ways for you to be involved in the life of the church as we go from this worship time, and I trust that you will look for them, and I look forward to partnering with you in them as we go. Now, will you bow for this benediction? You have been called and told to get up and walk. And so as you get up and walk and go, may the Lord Jesus Christ who has healed you go ahead of you as planner and preparer of your way. Go and as you go, may the Lord Jesus Christ go behind you as finisher and completer of all that's left undone. Go, and as you go, may the Lord Jesus Christ be under you to pick you up when you should fall. You and I most certainly will. And go, and as you go, may the Lord Jesus Christ be over you to watch over you and yours. And most of all, go, and as you go, may the Lord Jesus Christ be in you, incarnating his love for you so that you might walk in the ways that he has called you. Today and for each day that lies ahead. Amen. And amen.